Next up, we have Joel Alex, who is the chief decision maker for Blue Ox Malt House. Uh, Blue Ox Malt House is in Lisbon? Yes, it yeah. is. Uh, Joel grew up above a Montessori school, used to work with maps, and thought he would live his life as an environmental educator. Now he makes malt matter and enjoys keeping money in the rural agricultural community of Maine. If he had spare time, he would probably fill it with fiddling, contra dancing, and time outdoors. What is contra dancing? Um, does anyone know? Yeah, yeah. sure. So it's a, it's a rural New England uh, community dancing. So you dance with a whole room of people um, to live music, traditional music. It's, it's a lot of fun if you have not tried that. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. All right, well, we'll let Joel take it away. All right. So, um, well, thank you for having me. I'm really um, honored to be included in this um, and talking to you right now. Uh, I was sort of asked to tell a little bit about the story of Blue Ox Malt House and myself. So a little more background on me um, is that I grew up in Old Town, Maine, um, up in the Bangor area. And, um, you know, fast forward, was fortunate that. enough to go to school, uh, college in Waterville, and then subsequently um, study, I'm sorry, sub subsequently live and work in Farmington, Maine. And it was really in Farmington, Maine that um, I really connected with Maine's rural agricultural communities and um, developed a passion for supporting those communities. and um, and. And the way Blue Ox Malt House came around was that after five years working um, with different community organizations, primarily land trusts and, um, and trail managing organizations, I was ready to sort of move into agriculture, um, but also think about ways that we could develop develop markets, especially for agricultural products in Maine, that would funnel money back into these communities rather than extracting them out. And if you're familiar with Maine food systems, um, it's starting to be addressed, but there's a gap in value added. And, and, and in processing here in the state of Maine, we tend to export a lot of our um, agricultural products out of the state to have value added done out, out, out in other places. So I thought I was going to go back to school to study social entrepreneurship, get an MBA, study environmental resource economics because I like to do a lot of things at once and, um, and, come, and, and then hopefully eventually come back to Maine and start applying what I learned to um, uh, here, here in the communities that I really loved. Well, during that process, I talked to um, a craft brewer um, about supplying local ingredients and um, was joking that I should start a brewery if if uh, grad school didn't work out for me and he he was like don't do that because everybody's starting a brewery right yeah. so he's like what you should do is like we you should start a malt house because we'd all love to use local ingredients locally processed ingredients but no one's doing this right now so at the time, in 2013, in 2012, 2013, um, brewers that wanted to use a main grown malt, and I guess I should ask, who here kind of knows what malt is? Uh, I, it's okay if you don't. All right, so I should start there, right? So malt is basically the grain ingredient that goes into beer. Um, you can kind of think of it as being to beer what flour is to bread. It's a processed grain ingredient. Um, the process of malting can be applied to any grain, barley, wheat, rye, just like milling into flour can be. Um, and in that malting process, you are changing the chemistry of grain that basically allows brewers to extract those sugars and make something um, fermentable. Um, as well as, as get the color um, and other flavor characteristics out of the grain. If you were just to take raw grain, think oatmeal. Like what a brewer would have to work with is basically like an oatmeal porridge. And it'd be hard to make beer from an oatmeal porridge. So that we basically take grain, we soak it in water, and then we let it grow and modify we kind of break down all of the, the chemical components and 
inside the grain that would create porridge so that it frees up all of that sugar to be soluble in water. And then we dry it down and in that process we make the chemistry stable and we add flavor and color to the malts so that that can come through in the beer. Um, anyway, so no one was doing that in Maine, um, which means that brewers that wanted to use local Maine products were having to buy back Maine grain malted in Montreal through a distributor in New York. And I was like, that's stupid. I mean, we should be doing that value add and keeping that money and that economy here in the state of Maine. Um, anyway, still went, applied to grad school, went through it, and then um, once I got all my applications off, thought like, well, what if I don't get into grad school? I only apply to one place because I'm really um, picky like that. And, um, and basically, started to just kind of feel out what a malt house in Maine would look like and started doing some research talking to grain growers, to other, um, at that time there were four, five maybe operational craft malt houses in the country um, who were processing regionally sourced grain for local craft brewers. Um, I talked to grain growers in the state and realized that Maine's the largest uh, grain growing um, state in the Northeast. We have tens of thousands of acres of grains um, and barley is particularly important for malting and we had over 20,000 acres in barley and about seven to 13,000 of those were in malting barley varieties. So we had this amazing opportunity. You know, uh, as an example, New York's the next largest and they had 1,000 acres of barley in the ground. So, I mean, you can just see like we had this enormous opportunity, we we're not taking advantage of it. Yeah, really excited about it. By the time I was admitted, I was so hooked on this. I had started to meet with SBDC counselors. Um, I mean, I was working at a nonprofit. I had a great quality of life, but you know, I wasn't saving very much. Um, you know, working at a nonprofit in rural Maine, so I like had a basically bootstrapped by talking to Maine SBC, um, started going to the Slow Money Maine. How many people have heard of Slow Money Maine here? Um, well, like one, one person has. It, you should really look them up if you're interested in entrepreneurship in Maine. They've invested more into Maine's economy than the Maine Angels have, um, which you might have heard of. They're a group down in, that works in investing in Maine down in Portland over 10 or 11 million at this point that they've invested and they focus specifically on food economy um, and developing Maine's food economy and agricultural resources. So they, so I got connected to that network, started filling it out. By the time I was admitted to grad school, I was less than a month away from getting my first business grant to do a feasibility study and business plan and formally organized Block Malt House LLC um, or as an LLC. So sort of like happened really quick and I decided that I'd much rather be on the, you know, be on the ground doing this rural economic development than uh, studying it at, at school. So, um, and what's really great about Maine, if you're, uh, if, if you're interested in entrepreneurship and starting business, is that there are actually a lot of resources to help you here in the state. Um, I don't know how familiar you are, but with all of them, but So Many Maine was a great resource, Maine SBDC. Um, the early grant we received was from the Maine Technology Institute, um, we, which is great. They've been one of our strongest partners throughout the whole process. Um, and. And so slowly was able to build momentum. That first year in 2013, um, I basically had to put together a feasibility study. No one had looked at how much malt was being used, at who, um, at where it was coming from, how much was being paid for it. What time were you um, here? The kind of the, the amount of grain we were growing in Maine, Perfect. the malting potential for that grain. So I, and the interest in brewers of using locally sourced ingredients. And so I had to put a lot of numbers to that. 
To a point, I suppose. To build a business plan. <laughs> and I had to learn how to malt because I used to make maps and I didn't, malting wasn't part of my thing. So during that year, I actually left my job. Um, I had about $2,500 in my bank account when I did that and left my apartment. And over the next 18 months, I was based out of my car, moving around the state, working on this business plan. So um, I felt you know, that, that deeply about, about the potential for this for, for Maine. So I went abroad to Canada or you know, up to Canada to learn how to malt, came back with that knowledge, and then later in that year applied for several more grants, R&D grants, to begin piloting a product. Did that in 2014. Through so many main uh, an advisor I was working with brought on my first investor and partner. Um, his name is Steve Steve Culver. Um, he was an early investor and founding partner of, of Blue Ox Malt House. With his investment and his help, we were able to basically, over the course of 2014, find a location, um, secure a development loan from MTI, secure several other grants. Um, and put together a business plan that was financeable. Um, and by the end of that year, we had, our, we had found our place and moved into to our place into the, uh, in Lisbon Falls. So we um, spent all of 2015 building out that, uh, that facility, which is now the largest floor malting um, operation in North America. Um, and the largest malt house in New England, and actually probably the, well, uh, yeah, the largest malt house in New England for sure. Um, we're processing 8,000, well, 10,000 pounds of main grown grains at a time. We could do two batches a week. We can process about 850,000 to 900,000 pounds of main grains annually. Um, and so we've been growing into, the, into that, um, into, into that whole process. Um, and that took a year of 2015 to build out our facility. And really last year was our first year um, in sales. So it's, it's, it's sort of like getting off the ground was, was really big. Uh, it's a really big hurdle. We had capital hurdles, knowledge hurdles. Um, uh, infrastructure hurdles. We had to custom design and build all our own equipment, which we were able to do here in Maine, um, which was really great. We used um, Maine companies that were doing work elsewhere or had previously been doing drying down technologies for the lumber industry. We were able to work with them to create something that worked for us. Um, and. You know, I, I, I was really great to hear Kevin talk about um, Maine Beer Company's story because one of the reasons, I certainly could have started sooner with less ideal equipment if I didn't care so much about quality. Like one thing I'll say about our brand and what we do at Blue Ox Malls House is um, I don't personally believe that local necessarily means quality, but I think it should. Um, and I think it can, and I think it can for Maine. So I didn't, I wanted to make sure that we were doing the best job that we could do with the malt we were producing so that we could work with the best brewers and we could really highlight what Maine can do as, um, as a state and the products that come out of our state. So, um, you know, we actually have a sensory program as well. We're training all of our staff. Malt sensory is a very new thing. The method for it was only developed in August of last year. We had seen a preview of that. So we've actually been doing it for about a year. We do difference testing. We do true to brand testing on all of our products. We have five products. We've worked with over 100 breweries. We're selling um, not only in Maine, but in uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts as well. And, and we'll hopefully soon be, soon be selling to all of the New England states. Um, and we're, yeah, I think, I think I just said this, but we have five products. Um, and I don't know, I could go on and on, but I'll just stop there. <laughs> and if there are any questions, if we have time for questions, if yeah, I haven't eaten them absolutely. all up, then I would love to, to answer them. Questions?
Question for Joel. So I picked Lisbon Fall. I looked everywhere from Biddeford up to Caribou for location. And this was sort of, I like jokingly said it, but I'm sort of uncompromising. I had the vision for what I wanted to achieve. I had done the research to know what I needed to achieve that vision and, and try to get the most efficiency out of a space. I needed ceiling height. I needed, in Maine, we have a lot of space that's under 5,000 square feet, and we have a lot of space over 20,000 square feet available, but we don't have a lot in between. And we needed about, to do a, a traditional floor malting method, because that, that soaking the grain, that germination, and that drying down are the steps of malting, no matter what method you're using. But you could do that in a, a single vessel called like pneumatic. You could do it, um, in, in other methods as well. We chose to do it in a traditional European style floor malting, um, which uh, is where you lay out the malt on the floor during the germination and you hand turn it and interact with the grain during that process. It develops, you know, I, it, de it develops a product that is uniquely different than the pneumatic malts, which is what most people use because it involves less labor. Um, and then also I think is, I mean, besides just being like a better story and everything, it also um, is true to the idea that we wanted to not only try to, you know, push innovation in craft beer and, and the exciting things that were happening with craft brewers in the state, you know, be a, be a, a market for main agricultural products and do so in, in as environmentally and socially responsible ways we could. But we also wanted to be an employer in our, in our town, in our community. And floor malting is the way that we do that. We have to hire more labor for our, our, um, for our process. So I needed all of these things and I just, it took me a year and a half to locate the space. And I looked all over the place and at the end of the day, we found the place in Lisbon Falls that met all of the criteria I was looking at. It's really centrally located. The town is great to work with. They've been super supportive. Uh, we were able to move with them fairly, on a fairly quick time frame versus if we had been closer to Portland, I think it would have taken much longer than a year <laughs> to, to build out our facility. Um, the, yeah, it's, it's close to our customers who we would like to be a little cl like closer to customers because our, our, our growers, we go up there several times a year to talk to our growers, but they don't need us checking in every week to see how the grain's growing. We'd probably lose them as suppliers if we did that. They'd be like, go away. Um, but we want to make sure that our customers are, um, are, are having a good experience using uh, a main product and using our product. So. It's nicer to be closer to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Cool. That's, that's that story. Other questions for Joel? No? All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.